Hey, James Hill with Castle Lock here with Kobe Pennington, Chief Compliance Officer for Castle Lock. Um, we are discussing CMMC 2.0. Kobe, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so it's certainly been an interesting time. Um, you know, the, the CMMC 2.0 model is out. Uh, government has made some changes to the, the program, some of those fairly significant from where it looked like we were heading uh, with the 1.0 model. Um, the CMMC 1.0 was extremely successful uh, for U.S. government in improving, especially well, the Department of Defense, in improving the awareness around a problem that's existed for a while. And that problem is that the industrial base is highly targeted. There are advanced threats that are targeting the industrial base uh, that are causing real economic uh, impacts. They're causing security and safety impacts to troops that are, are deployed because our adversaries are able to duplicate, replicate many of those technologies through stolen um, intellectual property, both of private industry that's supporting the Department of Defense, uh, as well as you know things and goods that the Department of Defense is, is paying for. So I think that awareness has been really important for the DIB itself, but the 1.0, was probably a little too aggressive and too encompassing in trying to solve the problem. So a couple of the components of the 1.0 model was this all or nothing. You need to be doing everything, you know, 100%. And there were multiple levels, so five levels in total. Several of those levels weren't going to be used a lot, particularly level two. Didn't really have a, it wasn't really a firm resting place for compliance. So level one was for contract and federal contract information or FCI. Uh, and that's important to, to protect, but to be able to certify all the organizations out there that are only handling FCI was a lot of overhead for some very small organizations and that was very expensive. So they're able to dial some of these things back to a more uh, practical perspective and, and still accomplish uh, a lot of the, the goals that they intended to. So if, if I understand this right, um, we have CMMC 2.0, which is what you're referring to now, mm -hmm. right? But before CMMC 2.0, there was 1.02. Before 1.02, there was the DFARS clause. Has the DFARS clause gone away? No, so the start of the DFARS 252, 204, 7012 clause, which I'll just refer to as 7012, mm -hmm. Uh, further in, in our discussion, that clause, which is what really introduced the need to implement NIST 800-171 and the controls that were in there, that clause has never gone away, and that clause has, has always been effective since introduction, despite the introduction of, of CMMC. And in fact, the, the DFARS clauses, which is what actually gets you know, addressed in the, the contract, uh, between you and U.S. government or, your, you know, your prime contractor, will, which will flow that down. That clause has has always been in place and, in fact, is now supplemented by some additional clauses of 7019, 7020. There, was a, there also is a 7021 clause, which is around the CMMC, which is really kind of uh, in, in limbo for now as the, the CMMC 2.0 model goes through the final rulemaking process. But DFARS um, is always in place, has been, um, and is now uh, really probably what we need to be paying the most attention to. Even with the CMMC 1.0 model, uh, there was the introduction of the DFARS interim rule or what brought 7019 and 20 into to play. And we'll talk about what those mean specifically. But that's really an important area to, to focus. So there are some aspects of CMMC Model 2.0 that are still going through the rulemaking process. They're still figuring out um, some of the details around, uh, you know, who will get assessed and how they'll get assessed and uh, what to do with like plan of action and milestones or POAMs and how long those are good for. So there's there's some things that we're still waiting on, uh, but the the DFARS clauses uh, have always been there in a very important uh, area of focus. So is CMMC 2.0 here to stay? So, I mean, it certainly seems like government is, is committed to the CMMC program. 
and they put a lot of thought into it um, at the end of, of last year, at the end of 2021, and decided to, to make some changes to that, that framework. Um, some of those changes we know, right, which is you know, level ones that are just handling FCI, they won't have to go through a third party assessment process. They'll be able to do a self-assessment. Some organizations that are handling CUI, which previously was CMMC level three, now is, is level two. So they removed some of those levels that I was talking about that, that weren't going to be commonly used. Um, even some of the organizations that are handling CUI, depending on the impacts of that CUI to national security, they might be able to self-assess as well. Um, and there are some changes to how to handle POAMs and, and scoping. We have some clarity on scoping. The scoping guidance is, is available. We'll be talking about that in this conversation. Some of the things like, you know, how long can I POAM something for? You know, is DOD able to give me a waiver on these controls? That, those things we're waiting on final rulemaking, which they're anticipating taking between nine to 24 months to actually resolve those issues. But it certainly seems like the CMMC itself, um, they, they definitely are committed to this program. Now, it's still very pertinent to deal with the here and now. And the here and now is that we have the 7012 clause and we have these new clauses introduced by the interim rule. And there are some very important things to understand about what we should be doing with that and then how that fits into the CMMC 2.0. So if we put our focus in addressing the DFARS clauses that are already in place, that actually puts us in the best position to be prepared for CMMC 2.0 so that we can just pivot for those additional changes. I think that a wait and see approach you know, that certainly benefited some organizations under the 1.0 model as they're waiting for things to become a little more clear. And we're still in that position of waiting for things to be very clear on the, the 2.0 model. Um, but knowing that uh, there are going to be time-bound requirements around plan of action and milestones. And what that means is if we are going to implementing a certain control, uh, that's required by NIST 800-171. Let's say it's a technical control. We we need to have protection against malware, and we don't have that. You know, currently we're able to to mark that as this is planned, and I plan on addressing this at at this point in the future. Uh, where it looks like the 2.0 model is heading is that you know POLAMs will be allowable, but once you're awarded a contract, you have a certain amount of time to actually get that implemented. So you won't have a perpetual. I plan to do this, or you know, we've seen uh, some organizations that have addressed NIST 800-171 compliance by saying, I just plan to do this, the whole thing at some point in the future. Even under the existing DFARS requirements, that's, that's, going, to be, that's going to be problematic. So I think we have a lot to, to share and, and talk about there as far as you know, what's, what's important, but I really think that the focus is on we address DFARS to future-proof us against the, the the actual detail that may come out of the, the rulemaking process. So if we look at the DFARS clause, uh, it was introduced in 2013. And what they did is they pulled uh, controls from 853. Um, and then later on in 2015, they, the DOD really ratcheted up the supply chain requirements to include 800-171. When this happened, there were a lot of questions around also a change that was made in the DFARS where they started referring to covered defense information as controlled unclassified information. And this is this has probably caused the, some of the most pain um, as we step through scoping, which is a big part of um, any compliance program. So, um, Kobe, talk about here, if, if we're looking at CUI, how, what do we do? Sure. Yeah, so it's a huge issue. And like you said, in the 7012 clause, the, the term is covered defense information or CDI. And DOD has since stated that CDI is their implementation of a CUI program. But as you're working through this today and you've got this, this program and this model that are really built around protecting CUI, and understanding what information you have or are likely to receive that is CUI has been a very difficult foundational problem uh, to deal with, 
we built a model and program on top of protecting a data type that's not well defined by government. Government hasn't marked this data uh, particularly well, and they haven't provided information in, in contract documentation to really uh, give clarity around that. And so that's an existing problem uh, today, but there are a couple of tips that can be very helpful. So one of the things was last year, uh, DOD implemented, or actually in, in 2020, uh, released uh, a set of instructions. It's, it's DOD 5248. And in there is their program guidance on really establishing their, their CUI program. And uh, it covers what, what subcontractors can expect from U.S. government. And in there, it, it basically establishes that DOD is responsible um, for establish, defining in the contract documentation this information that we're providing the CUI, mark that appropriately, and then also define what data the contractor might be developing that would also be CUI. Now, there's a couple of things that are might be particular kind of helpful guidance that's that's a little bit loose because we know that that doesn't always happen. So the best thing to do is, you know, go back to your, your point of contact, either with your prime or on the government side and ask for some of that clarification if it's not in the documentation. That might come in the form of, if it's in the contract documentation, that might be in a DD-254. Um, that may not always be the case, depending on if there's also if there is or isn't classified information that's also part of that contract. It could be in a memorandum. That information should include, if you've been doing business uh, on this particular program for a while, maybe it's a new delivery order, maybe it's a new task order, what to do with information that was marked under some of the legacy data types. So how to, should you treat FOUO that you've been working with uh, previously as CUI? That's something that you should get from your, your point of contact. And then very likely any technical information, any CTI that has been protected with a distribution statement, really B through F, um, even though one of those is for federal only and really not applicable here, that information is likely to be CUI. So even in those cases where you may not be 100% sure, you can make some educated guesses on what you need to be handling as CUI. And as this program evolves, you know, the, the, the pressure and the ball is really in the court of DOD and, and other agencies, because CUI is an executive wide program to better define that, that information and, and put that in that contracts. But that, you're absolutely right. That has been a real, real issue for, for contractors to try to, to figure out. So CMMC 2.0, the big changes is don't worry about the changes to CMMC 2.0. There are DFARS clauses that we need to make sure that we are appropriately assessing today. So NIST 800-171 gives us those controls. NIST 800-171A tells us how to assess those controls. And the DOD assessment methodology tells us how to score those. So it really takes all three documents to know how you're prepared. And being aligned with the current DFARS clauses and really understanding where your program is at is the most important step that you can take today in preparation for CMMC 2.0. So don't have to worry about what actually comes out in the final rulemaking process. If you want to be uh, ready to go, if you wanna understand where you're actually at today, that's the process. And if you don't understand uh, or you need some, some help with how to actually assess your environment against these controls and some expertise, make sure that the organization that you get help from understands that the assessment objectives that are in NIST 800-171A, how to assess those for your environment and how to score your environment correctly. Um, this is really, really important. And the most important piece is is there's definitely the here and now aspect of, of DFARS that we should be paying attention to.
So Kobe, thank you for your time today. Appreciate you and this wealth of knowledge that you just freely share with whoever wants to watch this video. <laughs> um, so listen guys, next steps, you know, um, get a gap assessment. Uh, we want to make sure to understand where your organization is. You may have stepped through this on your own and just run into some issues um, and need some clarification and some guidance, but you know, certainly we're happy to assist in this with, with your organization. Uh, make sure that if you haven't yet, that you are going to register with DivNet. It's going to cost you a little bit of money, but it's not a whole lot of money. And it's definitely going to, going to help prove that you're ready, that you've read the DFARS clause and you know what you're doing. So make sure you get registered with DivNet. Finally, Castle Lock has the SPRS calculator. We encourage you to go and evaluate yourself there. Understand there are some intricacies with that calculator. Um, we make it very easy for you to make a decision, but the information leading up into that decision, you should really be asking yourself questions from the NIST 800-171A uh, guide that, comes at that, that has been released for 800-171 uh, Rev 2. Stay tuned here. Uh, we have uh, policy templates, procedure templates, SSP templates um, that we're happy to share with you guys. Um, this is stuff that we've developed uh, over the time that we've been running these assessments and we're happy for you guys to learn from us on those things. And of course, always you know, tune back in here whenever we have a new video to share uh, because we're gonna have all kinds of great tips and tricks uh, to help you along the way. Specifically, um, some of the things that did get cut out of the CMMC framework are really good maturity items for your organization to look into uh, enforcing. Um, things like making sure you've got spam filters, uh, things like making sure you have SPF turned on on your, on your DNS and for your, for your MX records. So there's some really good health kind of things that we're just going to go ahead and give you some tips and tricks and, and free advice on, on how to get in that stuff rolling. Uh, but I appreciate your time and uh, we'll talk to you next time.